We're in a situation in Syria where we don't like the current regime and we don't like the alternative regime either. So what are these cruise missiles going to do? Well, two things that were very interesting. Um, the idea of the bombs or the cruise missiles is fascinating to me because, as we said earlier, it's more of a statement, right? You get all of the downside and none of the upside because no one thinks that cruise missiles are going to be a game changer. And even if they were a game changer, do you really want the rebels taking control of the country? And if the goal is to protect innocent people in Syria, do we really think that the insurgency all of a sudden winning means that persecutions are going to stop? Which brings me to this idea of you know, involving ourselves in humanitarian disasters. Some of the people on Twitter who were um, talking to me and some of the people emailing, I told you, I, I really can't get back to the emails anymore. I, I do read most of them. It's, it's, you know, emails, many of you business people know, email's a tough tool nowadays. It, 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 you could spend all your time answering email or you could spend your time on your business. So, I mean, that's kind of where things have gone now. Um, but I do read uh, some of them and then the Twitter account has become useful for, for that too. Um, but many of you were saying, Dan, you know, how can we look away from the humanitarian crisis? And I remember so well living through the situation in the former Yugoslavia when it tore itself apart in the early 1990s. Uh, if you were living at the time and conscious and, you know, watching the news, perhaps you remember, especially here in the United States, I can't speak for any place else in the world, but there was such a feeling of anger and powerlessness um, when the situation in the former Yugoslavia turned genocidal, I don't think is too strong of a word, that one could easily find oneself a proponent of crusading expeditions to save people. Once again, it becomes like that hardcore history episode we did. I mean, you know, you look at when they put the people in virtual concentration camps in the former Yugoslavia. And I remember Time magazine and Newsweek magazine had on their cover a starving Bosnian, you know, I mean, ribs showing, hip bone, obviously starving behind a concentration camp fence. And you just look and you go, well, shades of the Holocaust. Are we really going to stand by and let this happen? And then Srebrenica happened and the massacres and all these. I mean, you practically want to go volunteer yourself for some sort of liberty legion where you can go and save these people. But this becomes a problem in and of itself. There's an interesting article uh, written by uh, Simon Jenkins from The Guardian in Britain where um, it's entitled Syria. It takes more courage to say there's nothing outsiders can do. And it's intended to combat that sort of knee-jerk emotionalism where we just feel like here's somebody who needs help and we're the ones capable of providing it so we should. I remember when... Um, the Batman movie, The Dark Knight, came out, and there was an interest. I know this is an interesting aside, I hope. Um, there was an interesting conversation about how it was that Batman, a quintessential American comic book character, finally required non-Americans to make a movie that captured the essence of the character, really, for the first time ever, the right way. And there were, you may not remember, there was quite a bit of talk, though, about how interesting it was. You know, here we have these British people and these Australians involved and all these other people who are not Americans. And yet they nail the portrayal down when American filmmakers and American scriptwriters and all these people were unable to and why that was. And one of the stars of the movie, Michael Caine, he, not an American himself, had a fascinating line about why it might be that foreigners were able to grasp the character better than Americans. And, you know, this has to do with the way the Batman character was more a metaphor for the United States as a whole. And Michael Caine said the reason why the British screenwriters were able to capture the character was because Americans as a country see themselves as Superman. You know, we're coming to save the day. Oh, there's a crisis. We jump into the phone booth. We rip off the shirt and boom, we rescue the girl falling off the building. You know, we defeat the bad guy and all this. But Michael Caine said, but the rest of the world doesn't see the United States as Superman. The rest of the world sees the United States as Batman and not the Batman from the 1960s Bam Pow series, but the Batman that is the more nuanced, dark knight, vigilante kind of character. In other words, this character that might be necessary, 
but no one's particularly happy with the way you know he comports himself or carries out his business. The rest of the world, Kane says, sees the United States as the dark night. And when you see all these people suffering in a place like Syria, you think, well, who can come and save the day? And the United States thinks of itself as Superman. The rest of the world is Batman. And who has the capability? And that's what some of these people were saying is, Dan, listen, you know, can the United States really just stand by when this is going on? I mean, if we can help, shouldn't we help? And this becomes a problem. It's a sort of a catch-22 with our military because you hear people say that all the time. We're the ones who have the capability to help. Therefore, there's a responsibility to do that. So here's my question. How long are you required to carry out that role until you no longer can? Does the responsibility exist until you've worn your military down to such a level that it's no longer capable so that you can't say anymore? Well, the U.S. is the only country capable of intervening. Well, not anymore. We intervened 10,000 times and now it's worn down to the nub. So we no longer have to intervene. Do you have to maintain that military then to keep it to levels where it can do its job when its job is morphed into intervening because it's the only country that's capable of doing so? I mean, it's, it's this it's this vicious cycle where the military spending that we have now is perpetuated because of things that the military needs to do that it only needs to do because we're the only ones with a military big enough to do them. I mean, that's an endless loop there, right? A feedback loop. But Jenkins had an interesting line in that Guardian piece. He said, um, quote, from the middle of the piece, quote, the Syrian civil war is awful to witness, but not exceptional. The Lebanese civil war next door claimed 120,000 lives and created millions of refugees. The Iraq war, a similar sectarian conflict, claimed even more lives and continues to do so. Sometimes, he writes, it takes courage to conclude of foreign conflicts that we can only do more harm than good by meddling in them. But the idea that not meddling constitutes quote, end quote, allowing them to continue is the short route to madness. He says, quote, the logic of most civil wars is that they either end when the combatants fight each other to exhaustion or when some neighboring power invades and quashes them. Dropping a few bombs would have been the nearest the British government got to Cameron's own charge of standing idly by. It would have been careless of outcome, half-hearted intervention, intervention light, end quote. Well, John McCain, the war hawk, who he's just one of those many, many people that needs to get voted out of office, has already slammed the administration for the pinprick idea of using cruise missiles by saying that we need to be more robust. We need to be willing to go in there and put boots on the ground if that's what's necessary to enforce this red line where we have international law out there that says you can't gas your own population. This is a weapon system that is not allowed. Let's talk about that for a quick second, because, folks... The problem with international law and enforcing international law is that the United States has no damn credibility on this issue at all. Do you know why? Because like most countries in the world, we enforce international law when the violators are people we don't like. And we don't enforce international law when the violators are people we do like. You know, one of the things that people forget is that one of the reasons cited for why we should topple Saddam Hussein in the second Gulf War was that he had used poison gas. He'd used these WMD. He had used them against his own people. What a horrific charge, right? And there's no doubt that it's true. The photographs were widely disseminated. Everyone knew about this. He also used poison gas on probably the largest scale since the First World War in the uh, 1980s in the Iran-Iraq War. Here's the problem, though, with this whole international law question. When Saddam Hussein used gas in the Iran-Iraq war, right, this violation of international law that we're so mad at Syria for, now this red line, he was doing it with our support. The positions of the Iranians that he was gassing were positions that we told him about by handing him satellite surveillance data showing him the specific tank positions, you know, opposite the Iraqi lines. We knew he was going to use gas. We knew he used gas. We had Donald Rumsfeld go shake his hand right at the time he's using gas. And some people even insinuate that some of the gas he used was made by, you know, elements that were provided to him by, you know, U.S. companies. All this was known. Why didn't we hit him then? Because we approved of what he did. He was fighting someone we considered to be an enemy, Iran. So if he violated international law while fighting our enemy, no big deal. 
When did we care? Oh, well, we want to topple that regime. We drag up those, you know, accounts where he used poison gas, and now we're going to enforce the rule. Listen, whatever you think about the United Nations, the United States is happy to enforce U.S. resolutions when we like what the U.N. resolutions say. We in, we're trying to enforce supposedly U.N. resolutions uh, in both Gulf Wars. But when we don't like what the U.N. resolutions say, we don't do a thing. There are some pretty prominent U.N. resolutions that go after Israel. We don't touch those with a 10-foot pole. I'm not arguing whether or not those resolutions are good things or bad things or tainted or not. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that if you're not consistent about enforcing these red lines, then they're not really red lines, are they? They are just Cassius Belli to go you know, use as a, another stipulation in any list of grievances that allow you to go to war with somebody or allow you to strike somebody or intervene in a conflict, right?